I want you to open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapters, chapter 6. It says, Now when God made a promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater than himself, he swore an oath on his own integrity to keep the promise as sure as God exists. So he said, I have no doubt I will promise to bless you over and over and give you a son and multiply you without measure. So Abraham waited patiently in faith and succeeded in seeing the promise fulfilled. It's very common for people to swear an oath by something greater than themselves, for the oath will confirm their statements and end all dispute. So in the same way, God wanted to end all doubt and confirm it even more forcefully to those who would inherit his promises. His purpose was unchangeable. So God added his vow to the promise. So it is impossible for God to lie, for we know that his promise and his vow will never change. And now we have run into his heart to hide ourselves in his faithfulness. And this is where we find his strength and com comfort. For he empowers us to seize what has already been established ahead of time, an unshakable hope. We have this certain hope like a strong, unbreakable anchor holding our souls to God himself. Our anchor of hope is fastened to the mercy seat, which sits in the heavenly realm beyond the sacred threshold, where, where, and where Jesus, our forerunner, has gone before us. He is now and forever our royal priest like Melchizedek. Okay, I'm going to speak to you about hope. And as you've seen in the passage that we're looking at, it starts from the man by the name of Abraham. And the Bible says that Abraham waited patiently and was rewarded with success. Now, if you know the story of Abraham, you would have think, hang on a second, he didn't actually really wait patiently, did he? Well, let me put it in context for you. If the Lord comes to you today and tells you that you're going to be able to play bass like Lisa does, and you decided I, the last song today, I'm just, the Lord's told me that, so I'm just going to get up there and I'm just going to start playing just like Lisa does, and you get up there and you find that you can't. Is a half an hour long enough to wait for the promise to be fulfilled? So we get down on Abraham because he didn't wait. So here's the story of Abraham. God tells him at the age of 90 he's going to have a son. And Abraham says, well, good luck with that. Sarah's 80. I'm no expert, but I just think that's a bit beyond, beyond God. Like, is that really what you want to do? And God says, yes, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And the, and the blessing that he says is to bless you to be a father of many nations. Of many nations and so today in this church we live under the blessing of Abraham that God gave to Abraham uh, today because Christ was the fulfillment of that blessing and through Christ we live under all those years ago of God standing there with Abraham at the age of 90 and he says I'm gonna bless you with a son well at the age of 90 that sounds okay but you better get, start getting busy God because 90 I don't want to get any older than that now the time between 90 and, and, and him being born was 10 years. Now, who here would like to wait for a promise to be fulfilled to take 10 years? See, you guys are impatient. <laughs> so let's just say God was going to bless you with a son. What sort of time frame are you looking at? Next week. <laughs> we could have our very own story as a church. Stan and Beverly. <laughs> I love your sense of humor, Stan. I just really do enjoy it. It's inappropriate at times, but it's just, that's, that's what just shocks me. And talking about inappropriate, here's his daughter. <laughs> you, you, you'd be happy to hear um, that your father wants another child <laughs> that's exactly what Abraham said yeah welcome Lorraine I've, I've just uh, shared with the church about the preschool too so um so anyway, so here's Abraham, and he gets impatient along the way, and Sarah gets impatient because nothing's really happening in that sort of world. And, and so he says to Abraham, let's just short-circuit this, and we'll get you to have a son through my servant. And so Hagar comes onto the scene, and that's Sarah's servant. 
And, and so she's like a concubine or, or she's like a mistress in our time, in our day and age to, to Abraham. And sure enough, a son is born and his name is Ishmael. And if you know the story of Abraham, as soon as we start being impatient with God, things start getting messy in our lives. Yep. Who's found that? When we think we're impatient with God and we're thinking, God, you're not working in my time frame. Everything starts getting messy because we start rushing the process. And I think that's such a, a, a common thread in our society because when it's not working the way we want it to work, exactly the way we want it to work, we want to chuck everything out and start going in another direction. That's exactly what happened with Abraham and Sarah, but maybe not so much because they've gone, well, it's still our child and it's still your child, Abraham, and the blessing will still flow down to you. But God turns up in an angelic form and says, Abraham, I asked you to wait but you got impatient. Things get messy when we stop listening for God's voice. Here in the scripture, though, it seems to negate that altogether, where it says, So Abraham waited patiently in faith and succeeded in seeing the promise fulfilled. And the thing I love about Hebrews, it's like with Moses. And he spoke about Moses didn't do anything wrong in God's sight. And we go back in scripture and go, hang on, hang on, hang on. He did do something wrong in God's sight. But God is the God of grace who says, no, I've forgiven it, so why do you keep bringing it back up? That's what the writer of Hebrews is on about. We hear about Abraham uh, succeeding in being patient. We go, no, it's not the case. But God says, I've forgiven it. I'm not remembering it. So why are you choosing to bring it back up? And again, we get so good at that and doing that in people's lives. We become judgmental and, condemn, and put them under condemnation because we go, but I knew what you did back then and we're trying to bring it back up, which pushes them down and lifts you up. Does that make sense? So here the writer of Hebrews is actually keeping Abraham up where he needs to be, keeping Moses up where he needs to be. And where is that? With Christ. Christ is in them and Christ is from them as much as Christ is in me today. He has lifted me up. He has lifted you up. Is that right? He has lifted you up so that you are on the same level as he is. And I think that's the most extraordinary part of what Christ does. Because again, we live in a society where there seems to be some hierarchy that we always have to achieve to get there. And Jesus says, you are already there. So stop trying. And here is Abraham. He waits patiently in faith and <laughs> succeeds in seeing the promise fulfilled. And here's what I love about the promises that God gives to you, that they will be fulfilled. There is a 100% hit rate on that. They will be fulfilled. They will be fulfilled in his time frame and asking you to be patient. So if the Lord asked you today to wait 10 years, what would you say? Okay. What would you say, Jen? You'd pray about it. Tell me that again, Lord. That's 10 years. That's a long time. Right? And that's the thing with people today. We want to rush into everything. We want to see everything happen today. So here's Abraham and he's told he's going to be the father of many nations. He has a son that he's not supposed to have had, but still that son gets blessed. And then all of a sudden Isaac comes along and here is Abraham. And in Abraham's lifespan, he didn't see many nations. What he saw was a son. Now you might think that the kingdom is actually working through you and it probably is and I want to say as a believer it is and you think that you might need to have more but Christ is saying look firstly for what I've placed in your hands and if you are faithful with that I will add to that. And there is Abraham, he's been promised to be many nations. So that's not just 10 years in the fulfillment, that's the rest of eternity in the fulfillment. But there is Abraham who didn't have a son and God is saying, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to multiply you and you're going to be the father of many nations. Great promise, Lord, but how long do I have to wait for it? And God didn't even give him a time frame. He says, you just have to wait. And that messes with our brains even more, doesn't it? We like to have time frames. We like to know what we're doing tomorrow or the day after or next year or whatever that is. We like to have that in control. But there is Abraham and God goes, you just got to wait for it and it will come. So here's, here's Abraham. And the Bible says that God adds his vow to the promise. Have you ever added your vow to a promise? 
How do you add, an, add a vow to a promise? So in court, we swear on a Bible. So it's a greater authority than who we are. That's what it's supposed to be. To most people these days probably don't see it as this great authority. But for us as believers, like that's the word of God. That's, that's such a precious thing right there. And the Bible is, is, is so, so specific at times and so calls you into these places at times. We go, wow, that's a really great authority. And we swear upon it. Jesus comes along and says, hey, don't swear on anything. He just says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. But here is God and he's adding his vow to the promise. So the promise is he's going to bless you and he's going to multiply you. But he adds the vow to it. And if the old, you've got an older version there, you'll see the word certainly, where God says, certainly I will bless you. I'm adding my vow to the blessing. And the Bible is saying because God will not break his promise, he is adding his vow to what he has said so that we'll be doubly sure that whatever God has spoken over your life will occur. Yep. So what has God spoken over your life, church? He has spoken over your life that you are a child of God. That's it. It's done. He's spoken over your life that you are forgiven. It's done. He's spoken over your life that you are eternal. It's done. He's spoken over your life that you have a relationship with the creator of the heavens and earth. It's done. These things are done. But often we slip back because we start wondering, because I'm not in that place that I want to be, am I really in the place that I should be? And all of a sudden we have this strange word in Christian circles of backsliding. But what that means is we're letting go of the hope that God has placed in front of us. And as soon as you start letting go of the hope, you start sliding away. The Bible here in this scripture talks about us running into the heart of God to hide ourselves in his faithfulness. Or if you've got an older version, it would say you have fled to him for refuge and found hope. Fled to him for refuge. Can you, can you connect with that analogy? Can you understand that? Let's run with all of your heart to a, for a place of safety that's in God and God alone. That's a very pretty way of saying what? Like, what does that mean? Because if it doesn't mean anything to you, your brain just shuts off because you've heard it 5,000 times before. But it's got to start meaning something to you. To flee to God, to be in a place of safety and a place of refuge. Can I explain to you how I flee to God in places of safety and refuge? Is that okay? Would that be helpful for you? And so there are numerous ways that I flee to God to be in places of refuge. And so when, you go, when I went through such a monumental moment on Friday, I went and sat with people that I know that love me and can speak back into that place and back into that world and can challenge me, that I know that they will tell me the truth. They won't just sit there and go, there, there, there. They will say and they will ask and they will challenge and they will call me into a place of strength. This is for me running to a place of refuge. Another place for me to run to a place of refuge is to pick up the word of God and find myself just sitting in it and reading it and absorbing it and letting today become known because I want to share with you some of the things that I found when I fled to God in that place of refuge. Church for me is a place of refuge. And I love coming to a place where people want to hang out together. I mean, we're all kind of a bit different. We're all kind of a bit strange, but that's okay. And they're right, Stan, well, that's okay, right? Yep. <laughs> but that's the thing. It's safe. On a Thursday night when I come to Bible study, it's that sort of statement with the church that I have and, and brilliant people like Lisa down here in the front and just open their hearts up and you just walk into this place of safety and you find out what it means to have a refuge in God when you have people that are around you that are of God growing with you and all of a sudden you start seeing your life grow rather than shrink because if you don't have those kind of people in your life, if you don't have that kind of passion for the word of God, when you run, you run away. We run into the refuge that is our God. And in that place, we find this beautiful, beautiful thing called hope. If you run away, you don't find hope. You just get tired. I know because I run. And I hate it. Physically. I hate it. You just get tired. 
right? But if I run to God and I find myself in the presence of the Father, and then I find this beautiful thing that we call hope, and it's that thing that the Bible says will never go away, will never disappear. It's here. It can never be taken from me. Even when I feel hopeless, God's just going, no, I've already declared over you that you are hopeful. So why are you starting to believe something that is not truth? And all of a sudden you start pushing back into the place of understanding who you are and what God has spoken over your life and your world. Hope. You run into the very presence or you flee is another version. You flee into the place of refuge. David himself would call God a refuge, uh, like that little nook in a rock that he would be able to come and hide within to know that he could be safe, to be safe. The Bible then goes on and says this. this. This is where we find his strength and comfort for he empowers us to seize what has already been established ahead of time, an unshakable hope. This We have this certain hope like a strong, unbreakable anchor holding our souls to God himself. I used to say that verse when I was a kid in Boys Brigade. Uh, if you've, does everyone know Boys Brigade? It's like Scouts, but it's Boys Brigade, right? We do the same sorts of things. Uh, we'd, it, was all, it was fun. I really, really enjoyed it and uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, but the whole concept of, of uh, Boys Brigade was around this verse, this sure and steadfast, this anchor for our souls. We used to wear it on our shoulders. When I was in Scotland, I came across the place where Boys Brigade was born, just by chance. I just walked in there and there's a plaque on the wall and it's just like, wow. Like, and for years I was part of that and I just looked at that and I thought, I got a photo of it and everything. And I just thought, you know, this probably doesn't mean a whole lot to a whole lot of people. But for me, who was a part of it for about 15 years, it was. It was, it was important to me. And I saw the birthplace of it and I just go, you know what, I'm standing on holy ground right now. Because whatever that guy's idea was, it went worldwide. And all of a sudden he started affecting generations of people. So I don't know if God just told him that he was going to be the father of many. I don't know what, how that happened or whether he started as a little boys club in a local church. But God took whatever he held and because he was so faithful with it all of a sudden all over the world people are coming to this place of understanding what it is to be sure and steadfast in God generations of boys 1887 I think the date was when it started I don't know how many generation that makes up but it's probably five six or seven or something like that isn't that cool isn't that cool? And so here is this verse. We have this certain hope like a strong, unbreakable anchor holding, at, holding our souls to God himself. I just want you to close your eyes just for a moment and I want you to imagine that anchor. When you've imagined it, I want you to open your eyes so I can see what you, that you're actually connected with me right now. Can I ask you a question, Miriam? What sort of anchor did you see? How, how big? Are we talking this? Are we talking this? Bigger than that? Is it like the, the shape of the... Uh, it's like that bigger anchor? Is that, is that helpful? How about you, Amy? Did you have a picture in your mind? What sort of anchor did you see? A massive, a Titanic anchor. <laughs> this is Amy over here. Amy is my next door neighbour uh, and she's from Canada. So just want you to welcome Amy. She's awesome. She's so full of joy. If you get to know her, you'll feel joy. And she's really cool. Okay. Uh, very happy every time you see her. So welcome, Amy. I don't want to embarrass you. Probably already have. It's <laughs> kind of how I roll. Isn't that right, Lorraine? There's no reason why it can't be fun. What about you, Lilian? What sort of anchor did you see? Huge. I want to just, because one of the things that I do is a lot of uh, like dream and vision interpretation. The size of anchor that you've just imagined represents the size of the hope that's inside of your life. Does that make sense? Does that encourage you for those that just saw the Titanic-sized anchor? Uh, so, Amy, what that says about you is that you are a woman of hope. And that when people get to know you, 
they will discover hope. They will receive hope because you have this enormous anchor that holds you back to Christ. It's the same for you, Lilian, because it's very big. Um, and that, again, and so if you've just imagined, like, you know those little sand anchors that you have off the back of a dinghy? And don't, don't be offended if that's, that's your picture or your image because it just shows that you're in a place of growth in the kingdom of God and he starts you from somewhere and he grows you to something else. And I'm sure that if I asked those three ladies uh, when they first came to Jesus what they saw, they'd probably look at me and go, you're an idiot. Is that new age? Stuff like that, right? But, but because they're of faith, because they, that we know so much of the Bible is symbolism, don't we? Like, here's, here's the writer of Hebrews talking about an anchor to our souls. Now, not too many of us carry around a physical t- titanic size anchor, do we? I've not, not seen it. Like, that might be a burden rather than a hope. But, but that's the thing with Scripture, right? There's this beautiful thing about it and the hope that ties us back into the throne room of heaven. Now, think about this because it talks about how it goes past the curtain into the Holy of Holies where the mercy seat sits. Now, if you were back in the first century, you would know that the Holy of Holies, only one person once a year could go in there. And that was the high priest that was elected by the people, by the Pharisees and Sadducees to go into that place to gain revelation from God. And so they would go in there and often they would have bells tied around their legs and a rope. Because if they passed out or died or dropped dead in the, in the midst of it, they had some way of getting the guy out of there rather than because they couldn't go in there. Imagine how bad that would smell. So they had to have a mechanism of getting the guy out. But in that place, he gained revelation. In that place, he gained understanding from heaven. And in that place, he came out and said to the people, this is what I believe God has said to me. Jesus, and through the book of Hebrews and through his death and through separating that curtain all the way back there, has said to us, we are now welcome. We are now welcome into that place of revelation, in that place of intimacy, into that place of relationship with the Father in heaven. We are welcome. Not only are we welcome, we are invited. We are invited. Now, I want you to think again. So if we can just close our eyes just for another moment and... Please just run, work with me on this. So you've got this massive titanic size anchor as, as Amy has and, and Lilian's is probably up there with the Titanic as well. And I'm sure Miriam's is, but hers is plain and ordinary, right? But it's just about to get a little bit more special. Now, I want you to imagine the chain that goes from that anchor to your boat. And when you've got that, I want you to open your eyes. Did you receive that vision? Did you see? It's just your imagination I'm working with here. We're all blessed with it, and I love it, because I reckon their imagination's an absolute gift from God. Um, but in your imagination, when you see a chain that goes from an anchor, it's it, like it's in relation to the size of the anchor, isn't it? Like you don't put a string on an anchor that's the size of the Titanic's anchor, do you? That would just be ridiculous. What is it that binds us to God? His love. His love, right? We are bound to him through his love. And the size of the chain would represent something of the size of the love that you have for the Father in heaven. And so if you've got a titanic size anchor, you've probably got a titanic size chain. Is that right, Amy? And the titanic size chain would show to her, and it shows to us now, that here is not only a woman of hope, but a woman of love. Is that what you saw, Miriam? You saw, you'd obviously see a big chain. And Lilian, you saw a, a big chain. Which again, if you sit with these three women after church today, these are the things that they will share with you. And these are the things that you will experience and encounter because that's the size of what's happening inside of them. And they are anchored back to a hope that is found in Christ that is unshakable. It has been... God has promised it. He has declared it. They have seen it. They have lived it. And now they are leaking it. Now they are pouring it out of themselves as to what God has seen and what God has done. And so whatever that image is for you, if it was just a small chain, again, don't be discouraged by that. Just know that the Father is about to grow you in your concepts of love and faith in Him because He grows you to places of strength. Is that right? You don't grow to places of weakness. When you grow, you become stronger.
This hope rep represents an anchor for our soul. We are anchored to the inner sanctuary where Jesus is our great high priest, which means he has done all that is necessary for us to be invited. Your sin does not separate you from that place. Yet, effectively, the only thing that keeps you from that place is your unbelief. The statement of saying, I can't believe that's true. That's, and that's your choice, right? That's, that's the place where you sit. That's the only thing that separates you from that inner and deep place with the kingdom. In the book of Corinthians, it will tell you nothing can separate you from the Father's love. Not angels, not demons, not death, nor life. Nothing can separate you from his love. If nothing separates, what's preventing us from coming and discovering this great hope? For every single one of you people right here in this room today, that this promise of hope that is in front of you is going to look different for us all. We're not all Abrahams. We're not all Sarahs. We're not all Lisas. We're not all Amys. We're not all Miriams. We're not all Lilians. We are who we are. And God has called us to discover more of him, to run to a place of refuge where we can discover safety that is in him where we can see that God is good for his word and true for his word, and we can see that the God who we worship and love is the God who is transforming us and changing us to become more like his son. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you for this place of refuge, this church. And I know that people, some have been here longer than I have, but for over 30 years, I keep on finding life in this refuge. There have been challenges, and Father, you know we're, we're walking through one right now. There have been deep valleys and dark times, and, but there, have been, there has been this hope and love and, and faith that just always seem to endure and will always carry us through. And so, Father, today, help us to see what we carry and that we can be faithful into that very moment. So, Lord, I thank you for three women that I've put on the spot this morning but have shared from their hearts of what they carry. And I pray, Father, through those three women, hope will become contagious that love will become obvious and that lives will change. And that's just through the three that I've pointed out. I know where there's so many people in this room that will just fall under that prayer as well. And so, Father, today let your spirit have, have your way with us and draw us further into your kingdom to know that we are safe and to know that your promise is assured and to know that there is success from the promises that you have placed upon us and that you've added your vow to it, that we can be certain to know that this hope will never be stolen from us. And if anything, Father, it will only grow bigger. And Lord, we say, may it grow so. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, Father, we declare that through Christ, he is the resurrected king and that we are being resurrected. I thank you, Father, for hope, and I thank you for life, and I pray, Father, that as we leave and go downstairs, have cups of coffee or do whatever is necessary, Father, I pray that hope and love will be the things that you continue to add and that allow us to see, draw us into those deeper places with you, and I just thank you, Jesus, that you've done that for us. So, Lord, I thank you for this time of worship. I thank you for this time of service. I just thank you for church, and I pray, Father, that you'll bless you and rest you in Jesus' name. The resurrected King is resurrected.